Hi! Welcome to Coffee and Real Talk for Writers, where we get real about the writing life. Writing might be a solitary activity, but becoming a successful author is anything but. So grab a cuppa, pull up a chair, and let's talk. Hello, and welcome to today's episode. I'm your host, Talina Winters, and today is Thursday, January 13th, 2022. All right, I need to get this show on the road with recording this podcast because I expect my kids home from school in about half an hour and that will just not be quiet. So um, I just want to start off by saying that I woke up this morning going, it's podcast day! Yay! So I am still very excited about doing this and um, looking forward to seeing where we, where this goes. I am thinking now about starting to book some guest interviews. Um, it has been a little more challenging than I thought to do it, uh, sorry, to get it, get the podcast onto YouTube, just because I have really slow internet. So even just the, uh, the video upload itself takes a long time. So I'm going to keep doing it, but I have to say that was a time expense that I wasn't necessarily prepared for. However, learning all the time, as my mom says. Okay, so this week, highs and lows. I had a really great week overall. Last week felt like, um, because I didn't get back into my office until Thursday, which was, of course, the day I recorded the podcast, but um, also just kind of felt like I had Thursday and Friday, which were both Mondays. Either that or it was like a Monday and a Friday jammed together, which for me are like the rev up and the rev down days of a week. Um, but I didn't have any of the productive days in between, the creatively productive days in, in between. Let me put it that way. Because on Monday, it tends to be my admin day. And then Friday, I do usually do some writing in the mornings, but I didn't last week because it was just come, I was just coming back from holidays. Um, and then, you know, like the rest of the day does also tend to be like admin and bookkeeping, which is like the bane of my existence. I call numbers the creativity killer, um, even though I do know how to do them. Um, it just, I hate them precious. Anyway, uh, so yeah, so starting on Monday this week, I had, I've had really great energy all week. Um, even though my sleep has been a little bit less than maybe ideal, just because, um, I've been starting to, w I've been waking up earlier again. Now my kids are back in school. And so I've been waking up a little earlier and I have been staying up a bit later just because I didn't honestly feel like I needed to go to bed earlier. And so it's been a little bit pr more productive. I do expect that I'll get some good sleep this weekend though. Um, and yeah, even though my holidays were busy with work-like things, like I mentioned last week, I did a lot of revisions of patterns and things. I am feeling very refreshed because they were different than I normally do and refilled a lot of empty wells in me. And this is how I've always been. I think it's, um, I'll be talking a little bit later in the episode about the Clifton strengths. Uh, my number one Clifton strength is achiever. And when I found that out, it helped me to understand that, um, helped me understand why for me, a rest is as good as a, a break. What is it? A rest is as good as a break. I don't remember. I don't remember the saying, but basically the idea that for me, when I'm resting, I'm not actually usually doing much actual resting. I'm just doing something different. And that is often just as cr cr refreshing for me as um, for some people going to lay on a beach, which the idea of that gives me hives. I have done it. I grew up in a tourist town with a lake, but I spent very little time on the beach and there's a reason for it. Um, anyway, so yeah, I think that what was going on last year with the burnout, um, I think I was more creatively burned out than I actually realized, but I think it was just part of that, uh, that was just so hard to get Sphinx's heart out and it just took so much longer than I expected. So that in itself was a drain on my creative energy. Um, uh, my writing coach, Becca Syme, she talks a lot about energy pennies and how those work with our strengths. And I think I had been outputting one, like one of my top strengths is, is input, which means I just love to gather input all the time. And it can be from almost any source. And, you know, like, it's just, it's something I, 
I need to constantly be inputting. Um, but I think what happened last year is I had output so much and I was just constantly outputting for so many years in a row. Actually, I was outputting probably more than I was refilling on the input side um, that that was contributing to my burnout um, and contributing to the general stress that I was feeling. And over the holidays, I, as I said, I didn't, I didn't really read much, but I did watch a lot of movies and I listened to a lot of podcasts. My goal was kind of to like catch up on all the podcasts I missed, which did not happen, but I did get through almost all the podcasts I missed in December that I was interested in. Let's be realistic. I'm not listening to every podcast episode put out by every podcast I'm subscribed to. That would be lunacy. I do nothing but listen to podcasts, but, um, of the ones I wanted to listen to, I think I have like one episode less than, left from December that I, I didn't quite get to yet. And I will. Uh, so yeah, I think just getting that tank filled up on the input and achiever, because I, even though I was like, as I mentioned before, I was, I was like doing a lot of niggling tasks that, um, I felt pulling at me, I felt that pressure to get them done and I hadn't been able to get them done before. So getting those done has really helped as well. So yeah, that has made for a productive week this week. Although you may question my definition of productivity in a minute when I tell you what I did, but that's all right. Um, so for editing, I, as I said, I'm editing a project for one of my favorite clients and it's right on track and it's actually even a little ahead of the, of the schedule that I thought, even though I was pretty... Um, I, I do my, my editing in the evenings after supper, uh, cause I'm more of a night owl person. I have nighttime, high nighttime energy. And so <clears throat> that's a good time of day for me to edit. So yeah, I didn't edit Monday night, even though I typically would just because I was feeling a little bit, um, lower energy. I think just with the schedule change that day and stuff, uh, I did some ad mini stuff, ad mini, <laughs> that's your word for the day. Anyways, I did that instead, but I am still, even despite that, I'm still actually a little bit ahead on that project from where I need to be. So that is awesome. And, um, for writing again, I, I haven't got out as many words as I'd like to have to stay on track for my, um, self-imposed deadline. But, uh, first of all, I have grace in that deadline, like way more grace than I used to give myself. So I'm, I'm doing okay. But the other thing that I learned to do, because this, this actually just helps me get over the resistance of getting in the chair. Instead of uh, counting words, which I do count my words, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but uh, a, word a daily word count isn't my measure of success. I haven't used that as my measure of success for several years, and it's been hugely beneficial for me. Um, basically, I think it was like early 2020, I think even right after the pandemic started, I read the book Indistractable by Nir Eyal. And I will put a link to that in the show notes. Uh, but it was a f my first real introduction to the idea of time blocking. And I started using that, but he had just such a powerful quote, which I usually keep near my desk. But of course, uh, my cats have probably ticked it away because I don't have a good bulletin board here right now. Uh, but the quote was basically... Oh, I'm going to butcher it. But the, the quote was basically that you, if you don't end up, if, if you don't show up, you're not going to get anything done. And that is not the actual quote. I wish I could remember it. Sorry. But uh, it just, it was so impactful to me. Just like, well, yeah, like when I sit down to write, I always write something like, but even it, but if I don't sit down to write, I, I don't let's, I mean, it's, it's like a no duh thing, but, um, you know, like you can't just sit down to write and think, well, I'll only write if I'm inspired to write. Like, that's not the way it is. It's like, you just got to show up. You make that appointment with yourself and you show up. And from that time I have make, been making my writing block, my first block of the day. Well, not quite first. I have like some journaling and stuff that I do first, but it's my first creative block, my first long block of work because it's the highest priority to me. And I know that if I don't do it first, I will find a million reasons not to do it. And I show up for it. Like basically 
my goal for the day is to make sure that I showed up with the intention to write, even if I don't actually do any writing during that time block. And sometimes I don't. Um, what I found this week is like, I, I don't do any writing on Mondays because that's my admin day. But Tuesday, because I hadn't written in my manuscript for three weeks. Um, yeah, about almost three weeks, maybe. Yeah, it had been, it had been pretty close to three weeks by that point. Not quite. Um, I needed to reread everything that I had written. So in that time block that day, I reread and I kind of edited as I went, reread everything that I'd written and got through the 15,000 words that I'd written and went, huh, yeah, I still like that. This is good. I can't wait to see what happens next. I mean, I do have an outline, but I still want to see what happens next. Um, and that was, that was my writing day. Then yesterday, I went ahead and I finished a scene. I'd actually intentionally left myself kind of in the middle of a scene before I went on my break. And at the time I was also a little bit not sure where I was going to go with it, but also cause it was, it was kind of a complicated scene, but also I did that because then when you come back from a break, you're not staring at a blank page and that just helps with resistance. I do not know why, but it's just, like even a single sentence on the page makes a difference for that intimidation of getting started. So I had about, I think, 500 words written in this chapter, which I then went and finished yesterday. I wrote 3,000 words yesterday. And that feels great. I had a 3,000 word day, but that's definitely not the way it goes every day. Oh, however, you know, kind of like my, my ideal is, is to kind of average out 3,000 words a day if I can. And this morning... I sat down in the chair and before I even opened up my manuscript, I was in a research rabbit hole, but that's okay. It was a research rabbit hole that I had triggered yesterday during that writing session. Um, because I was like, I need to figure out this about what my character did. I need to figure out this about their backstory. I don't know enough about that. And this is actually going to affect several themes in the story going forward. I'd even known that while I was outlining, it's like, oh, I know she that you know, that she's going to do this kind of thing, but I need to figure out more about that. And, um, again, going back to strengths, part of the way I figure those things out is I research my way out of it. So I spent like the first hour and a half, two hours of my writing block this morning doing research and that still counts. <laughs> and then I went and I reread what I'd written yesterday and edited that. And then after that, I went and had lunch, but I came back and I told myself, oh, I need to do the podcast next so that I'm done before my kids are home from school. Um, but I ended up going, okay, well, I'm going to go do the one sentence, right? Like, so I, I like, I don't have like a blank page when I start tomorrow. And I started that one sentence and I ended up writing a thousand words. So yeah, that's now why I'm kind of rushing through this a little bit, but that's all right. <laughs> I got a thousand words out anyway. They were like accidental words and I'm still not done the chapter. It's just, it's getting me the, given me the very first part of it. So I'm really excited to get back to it tomorrow morning and I'm sure that I'll just keep going with it. So these are little tricks <laughs> that you can try yourself to see if they work. But basically what I wanted to, you to get out of that is that Sometimes, like some personalities, they do really, really well with a word count goal and that helps them with consistency. That is not what works for me. That stresses me out. So what I need, what I count as a measure of success is that I have sat and worked on writing related activities, whether it's research or outlining or planning or actually drafting or revisions or whatever. I have done that for the full amount of time that I said I was going to do that that day. I made it a priority. And if I've done that, then I can consider that successful. Now, the way I use word count, actually, I have a very convoluted spreadsheet where I track my word counts for every project. But to me, that actually tells me more about my progress on the project itself it is not a success metric. So yeah, moving on from that. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that though. Like, like, because I know every writer's process is different. Like, does, does anybody do it kind of like me? Do you, or was this helpful for you? Or, or are you like, no, I'm word counts all the way, baby. I need to know that I've hit my minimum 500 a day or whatever it is your goal is. Um, cause there's so many right ways to succeed. There's no 
wrong way to succeed. Let's put it that way. There's so many right ways to be a writer. And I wish that I would have known when I was um, earlier in this business that just because something works for somebody doesn't mean that I can do that myself. Um, that's one of the reasons that the strength has been beneficial to me. Like, but that there's another way that I can do it that will, that will be successful for me. So, um, just to, my low for the week before I move on to, I'm going to talk more about strengths in a minute, but unfortunately my massage therapists, uh, well, they're the off their the receptionist called this morning and canceled my, my, a therapy appointment for tomorrow afternoon because my massage therapist has the flu, which sucks. So please send positive thoughts to my massage therapist that he gets better. But um, the other unfortunate thing is that um, last week my back was in a, in bad shape and it still is. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not sure like with how booked up everybody is around here, I may not be able to get in with anyone else until my next month's regular appointment with, with my normal therapist, but I'm going to see what I can do because I want to be able to keep walking. I did go for an actual walk yesterday because our weather has warmed up and it's gorgeous and I'm looking forward to doing that more and that may help as well. Okay, so um, I keep talking about the strengths. Now, just a quick overview if you're not sure what they are, I'm talking about the Clifton Strengths, which is a it's not really a personality test, but it kind of is uh, developed. It's from Gallup, and you can just search Gallup Clifton Strengths or G Gallup Strengths Finder, and you will find the test. I took this test as part of the uh, Write Better Faster course that I took in early 2021 with uh, Becca Syme and, an, and a coaching cohort. Cohort, that's a hard word to say. Um, and it's just, it's been eye opening for me. I've, I've learned so much about myself and now my, my entire family's taken the test and I'm like always talking about these because, um, I was telling my mom about it just like last week and cause she was like, I don't know why I procrastinate so much when I know I have to get this done and I'm just doing all these other things instead. I'm like, well, maybe discipline isn't high in one of your strengths. And and she's, and she's like talking down on herself. I'm like, no, just because that's not something that you're good at doesn't mean that there isn't something else that you could use to accomplish the same goal. That is one of your strengths, but don't talk down to yourself about it. Like for me, one of the things that was mind blowing to me when I got my strength results back was, um, I mean, I, I knew I was very driven to achieve things. So the fact that I was a number one achiever didn't surprise me at all. But I didn't realize until it was said blatantly to me that an achiever starts every day from zero. And if you haven't achieved things by the end of the day, you actually feel like a failure. And I'd always felt kind of broken because of how driven I was and how I had to be doing things and actually getting things done all the time that I couldn't, like I couldn't even just sit and watch TV. It's, I mean, it's one of the reasons I learned to do handcrafts is so that on long trips I could... I could be doing things. I could be doing things while I'm watching TV and feeling like I was accomplishing something. I now come to realize that even reading books and watching shows, those are achieving things for me. I'd never thought of it that way before, but it's totally the way it works. Um, so yeah, it it's not something that's broken in me. I'm also high in intellection. And so comments like, I think you're overthinking it. My husband has said that to me quite a few times because he's not high in intellection. I think you're overthinking it. And that used to really bother me. And now I'm like, actually, that's my superpower. So back off. <laughs> ah. <laughs> he laughs at me. Anyway, so yes, knowing what your strengths are can be helpful to um, understand that the things that you're doing aren't necessarily things that are broken about you, but they're actually your superpowers too. So I do recommend checking out the test. Um, go check out the Write Better Faster Academy from Becca Syme. Highly recommend it. It's been so great for me and so many people I know. And I know that uh, this has been kind of catching on. So if you're listening to writing podcasts at all, you're probably familiar with Becca already. But and just in case you aren't, go check her out. Anyway, so yesterday while I was doing my journaling in the morning, uh, I had this fun thought about my strengths and uh, my addiction to podcasts, as I mentioned earlier, and how each of my top 10 strengths are kind of like fed 
when I listen to a podcast, and which is why I'm so addicted to them. And there's only like two of the top 10 that I, I couldn't figure out a way that it was fed energy panties by listening to podcasts. So Achiever loves checking, that's my number one, loves checking off something from a list in only 45 minutes or less, as opposed to the time it takes to listen to a whole audiobook, say. I like listening to audiobooks, but I find it much easier, especially lately, to just put on a podcast instead because it's a much quicker time commitment and then I've achieved something. Number two is connectedness. So that strength loves getting the industry news and perspective on my business and on others' businesses. Number three, Relator, loves hearing more from my favorite hosts in a week. That's why I love podcasts like this, where I'm hearing from the same host every week. And um, I, even though I, I like the interviews afterwards and I learn from them, I really, really love the introduction from the host because it's like, oh, I'm like hearing from a friend today. So that's, um, that's what Relator is, loves about it. Now, my number four is responsibility. And honestly, I wasn't, this was one of the ones where I was like, well, I don't think that that one is fed per se by listening to podcasts and that's okay. Um, my, my responsibility is fed by putting the things I learned in podcasts into practice, I think. Uh, number five is learner. And I think the reason why this one gets energy pennies is obvious. Uh, but not only does this one love to soak in the knowledge I get, uh, it really pairs up with my connectedness to share that knowledge appropriately with others who may benefit from it, um, which is one of the reasons I want to start a podcast. Number six for me is input. So this one, also, I think it's a little obvious why I love the podcast, but the variety available in podcasts really feeds this it's because I can let, listen to a lot of different things about different kinds of subjects in just like a relatively short amount of time. Uh, number seven for me is discipline. So I think this one and responsibility kind of fight with my other strengths about podcasts a bit, actually. So they're the strengths that are trying to make sure I don't let my listening time interfere with other things I should be doing, like, say, writing. And I was actually really struggling with that before the Christmas break, is that I would start listening to a podcast first thing in the morning, and then it would go for longer than I had before I was supposed to be in my chair working. And I, I knew it would, but I would still start. And I tell myself every time this little lie, oh, I can turn it off in the middle. <laughs> and I never would. So I was uh, really struggling with that. But this week has been good. And I think it's because I'm, I'm t topped up. And also I've reworked some things to make sure that I get the right amount of podcast listening in my day. And still get my work done. Uh, number eight for me is intellection. So podcasts usually give me plenty to think about. Number nine is Activator. So I'm not sure what this one gets from it, except for that I think that podcasts help activate and inspire me. And I think that's maybe why um, also I wanted to start a podcast. In fact, I, I could recognize my Activator working because I got the idea to start a podcast. Like the, the final... I, I'd wanted to start one for a while, but I just didn't really know what I would do and I didn't know if I had the time. But then I listened to Leslie Penelope's podcast. Actually, I listened to her on an interview first and her kind of podcast she did. And I'm like, I could totally do something like that. And like, it was probably a week later that I was just like creating my cover art, and, you know, figuring out all the things I needed to do. And I was just like, oh yeah, I'm totally doing this. So that's what Activator did. It just got that ball rolling right away. And number 10 for me is context, which is seeing what others have done and what's come before me by listening to all these other podcasts helps me make better decisions going forward. So there's my top 10 and my podcast addictions. <laughs> I hope that was as fun for you as it was for me. Anyway, okay, now on to uh, my business and marketing progress for the week. And I'm going to be talking about marketing kind of like is the main focus for the rest of the episode here because there were some really interesting things that happened this past week. So for me personally, uh, yesterday I applied for my first ever, no, the day before, I applied for my first ever blog tour with Goddess Fish Promotions. Um, I'd heard about them in the Wide for the Wind Facebook group and they were really recommended and I've got a few author friends who've had good success with blog, uh, blog tour promotions and I've never done one before. So I thought, oh, well, we'll give this a try. I've been wanting to try it for a little bit, but it was hard to decide what to do, what kind to do also, and what I had time to do. 
and how much I want to pay. So I finally made the decision. Um, I'm going to be doing it for my first book of the Rise of the Gregory series, the epic fantasy one called The Undine's Tear. And uh, it starts in March. And I'm excited. I'm curious to see if there's a spike. Um, I'm not really pushing much marketing on this, even though the second book is the book that just came out, but it's because the series isn't complete yet. And I'm going to get more about, uh, into the reasons why for that in a minute. But basically, even though I know that it's probably going to be a good, another couple years, at least before I get the third book of this series out, um, it's not because there are only the two main books in the series out, plus a, a, a prequel, just a little prequel for it, uh, that it's just not really worth spending the marketing time on it. I am doing a few things, but right now my primary focus for the series is to just get some good reviews on both of the books. So I have them both on Book Sirens and they are slowly getting reviews. And when the reviews, reviews come in, they're usually rave reviews. So that's really good. So that's just creating some social, um, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> It's like social credit, but that's not the word. I'm sorry. It just went out of my head. Uh, but so that when I do have at least three books in that series, that I will be hitting the marketing a little harder because I can then make it profitable. And in the meantime, word of mouth is spreading and I do see slow growth in that series, but it's just taking time. Anyways, I also got my newsletter set out, sent out on Monday, which was fun. I was like doing my newsletter. Um, I've definitely seen a slowdown in sales this week now that the Christmas season has passed. I had that little freebie Christmas story all I want for Christmas up um, that I'd published in December, but at the beginning of January, I put it up to 99 cents. And I've seen a very few sales on it since then, but I mean, Christmas is over, guys. I didn't expect that one to keep going. And I, I do expect that I'll see it uh, pick up again next Christmas. And I may even put it up for free again uh, next year or this year, I guess, um, going into the Christmas season to just kind of give that a boost. And by then I'll have had at least one or two of my romances out. Um, and so people will have more to read through too, which will make a difference. Okay. So yesterday I mentioned the wide for the win group on Facebook. If you are not part of it, please go look it up. It's one of the best, loveliest places to be in the author community. But I got permission from Susie O'Connell to share this. She posted this really great um, perspective and post about marketing books and, and doing it too early. So I, I want to share this with you and then I'm going to reflect on it just a little bit in the, um, from the perspective of somebody who writes in multiple genres and does not put out books quickly. Okay, so this is what Susie wrote. I had a conversation with an in real life friend a couple weeks ago. She just finished her first book and called me to ask about formatting and cover design and marketing. And I'm going to say the same thing to you that I said to her and that I've started saying to every new author I talk to these days. It's darn difficult to sell that first book. You don't have an established reader base yet to sell it to. You don't have the social proof. There's the word I was looking for. Anyways, you don't have the social proof yet. Reviews or additional books out that tell readers, hey, I'm more than a one-trick pony. You are safe to take a chance on me. You don't have any more books out for readers to devour after reading and loving your first book. You don't have any more reader, sorry, you don't have any more books to leave a deeper and more lasting impression in those readers' minds. It takes a few books to leave a lasting impression on readers and for them to fall in love with your writing style. With no other books to buy from you, they are likely to forget you while they find other books to read while they wait for your next one. Most new authors don't want to hear this, but in my experience, and having watched hundreds of authors try so hard to sell that first book and get disappointed at how difficult it is and give up, new authors' time is better spent focusing on writing a couple more books. First books are for getting your feet wet for learning the market, for figuring out which author's readers will most enjoy your writing, for honing in on your precise categories and audience, for making mistakes and learning, for slowly building a loyal reader base and newsletter list, 
for fine-tuning your author brand. There's a reason so many established authors tell new authors who ask this question that a new author's energy and time is best spent focusing primarily on writing more books. So while you're working on the next books, experiment with marketing, but keep your expectations realistic and be patient. I say this as someone who regularly says, patience is definitely not my strongest virtue, but I've learned to embrace it. Then Susie goes on to tell her story about how she got established and she didn't publish, she published her book, first book back in 2012. So I'm not going to read the rest of the post, but if you join the Wide for the Wind Facebook group or you go search for her post in there, um, it, I do recommend you go take a look at the rest of it. However, I want to reflect on what she said um, in the first part and just in light of my own experience. And I 100% agree with her um, about the purpose of marketing when you're new. It's even trickier when you're a multi-genre author. So you're not putting out necessarily books all in the same series right away. And if you write um, and release fairly slowly. Now, I didn't plan to release things slowly. And honestly, as I mentioned before, I think in my last episode, um, this new series I'm starting is the most, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Ooh, having a hard time with the words today. I'm a writer, not a speaker. It's the most um, uh, strategic that I've been. Uh, you may have noticed strategic was not in my top 10 strengths. <laughs> it's down at number 14 or something like that. Anyway, um, yeah, this is the most strategic I've been about business decisions about a, a series that I've put out. I chose a series partly because it's what I wanted to write and, and in a genre I wanted to write, but also because it's a series, that, uh, it's a genre that's doing really, really well. Also, for the first time, I'm writing right in the genre. No cross-genre stuff. I knew what the genre was about before go I started it, and I chose stories that would work well in that genre. I have never done that before. And so being strategic is good, um, but there's also a reason I decided I'm going to put out at least three books in the series before I switch back to go and finish that epic fantasy series and get that third book out which is probably going to take at least a year or maybe two years of writing to do. Um, I, I, I'll be able to get some more books in my catalog for people to read through too. And I already have several books that are romance-like. They're not this exact genre. They're not sweet romance. But I did see one very interesting review um, in the past couple weeks that someone had read uh, which one of my books they'd, I, I think they'd read all I want for Christmas, but it could have been that they read the Friday night date dress, which is a, it was well, my first novel. It's an inspira inspirational, sweet. It's not sweet. It's an inspirational romantic women's fiction is essentially what it is, but it's, it's basically a clean and wholesome romance, but with a lot more depth to it than they usually have. So I basically, that's how I, I market it even though it doesn't quite fit the normal tone of the genre. So it's kind of a good way to lead into my, into my book finding heaven in the sense that it has similar themes, um, but it's a lot shorter. I put it up perma free in 2020 and it's done really, really well, but I'm, because I didn't really have something that was a really good fit for people to go to next I didn't see a ton of read through, which is why I was surprised to see this review that somebody basically said they wanted another book of mine to read after reading. And I'm pretty sure it was that one, the Friday night date dress. So they went and read finding heaven and then they left a rave review about it. And that's why I was like, well, I need more romances out. I can write them more quickly and then I can get a several books out in my catalog and have people going through and buying other books from me while I go back and I continue to write the epic fantasy so I can finish that series and be done with it. Um, and I don't know what I'm going to do after that, but I am probably going to not be writing a lot more 300,000 more word books because they take too much time. As fun as they are to read and write. Okay, so I just want to talk about how I kind of experimented with marketing in the last five years, because I would say at this point, I am just now starting to figure out 
how to market my books. And I've got like three genres already and I've, you know, been doing this now since, I mean, technically I, I published my first book in 2015, but I really didn't do anything with marketing until I published my second book, Finding Heaven in 2017. So I've been basically learning how to market. I've been learning longer, but I've been actually learning how to market my books for five years. So what I did when I published Finding Heaven, um, cause I didn't know tons about what to do and I wasn't as hooked in then to the different resources that are available now is I thought I'll do book signings and how hard can this be? Well, it turns out it wasn't hard at all um, because I had a professional c cover. Uh, it's different. It was different than the cover that I have now. And it was the wrong genre of cover, but it was a professional cover and it was beautiful. Um, and I created a, a sell sheet and I created a media kit on my website and I was very professional and I found out I actually had a really, I was fortunate to know author Adam Dries who had done a lot of in-person selling and a lot of book signings. I'd met him at a conference and I asked him, he didn't know him very well. And I sent him an email and asked him if he had any tips for me for getting book signings set up. And he very graciously sent me some wonderful emails about that. Very thankful to him. Um, he's now written a book on it uh, called Five Tips for Se Successful Signings. So if you would like to check that out, I recommend you go grab his book because he put all the knowledge that he gave me into that book. And he's given that to many other authors as well, the knowledge. But now you can actually say thank you by paying for the book. Anyway, um, I digress. So I had all these things set up and I had this professional demeanor and I contacted the consignment stores of all the chapters indigo, sorry, I, the consignment managers of all the chapters indigo stores in Alberta, pretty much. Um, and keep in mind that the closest one to me is three hours away, and it's actually not in Alberta; it's in BC, in Fort St. John. But the closest one in Alberta is five hours away in Edmonton, and then most of them are in Edmonton. There's a one in Red Deer, and then there's several. Uh, there's just quite a few in Calgary. Um, so Calgary's eight hours away from me driving. And what I did is I contacted them all and sent them the information and almost all of them said yes, which shocked the pants off of me. So for one very busy winter, I was taking trips down to central Alberta every other week through the winter from January to March, which is not a good time to travel. Um, and I was doing like four or five signings per weekend. It was insane. I'm very thankful I had some places to stay for free down there because I wouldn't have been able to afford it otherwise. But wow, did I learn a lot. I learned a lot about um, marketing my books from doing that. Now, I want to tell you right now that doing book signings is not a profit-making venture. Not when you're a new author and no one knows who you are. But it is a fantastic way to make super fans because you make some amazing connections with readers. And by the way, if you're going to do a book signing, you don't get to, get to sit in a chair and watch customers walk by. You actually have to be standing up and engaging with them because they've got things to do. But if you uh, develop your elevator pitch, and I have a blog post about that on my writing tips blog, um, develop your elevator pitch and catch their attention in that 10 seconds, most of them are, qu are quite happy to come and talk to you. But otherwise, they just think you're one of the staff standing there flog flogging books or just there to answer questions. I got a lot of questions about where the, where the bathrooms were, but yeah. So book signings are great though, because you're selling this book and on any given weekday, you're going to have hundreds of people go by you, uh, most of the time, unless the weather's poor, um, within the few hours that you're set up there, that is hundreds of opportunities to refine your elevator pitch, to find it, well, what it is about that that appeals to people. What is it about your books that appeal to people? Which kinds of readers actually are interested in the books you write? And, and I was surprised sometimes the people I, I thought would be my target readers were not. And sometimes people who I didn't, I wouldn't have guessed would be interested in my books. They were. So, so it's, uh, a, you, you just don't get that kind of uh, direct contact when you're marketing online only. However, it is a very expensive way to get that education. And so I have, um, 
even before the pandemic hit, I had decided to really dial back on how many signings I did uh, because it, it's too expensive for me when I'm having to drive so far. If you have a local bookstore, though, absolutely do some book signings. I highly recommend it. So in early 2020, I, I mentioned that I, I decided I wanted to learn how to do ads. And so I took the Brian Cohen's, um, it was called Amazon Ad School or Amazon Ad Profit Challenge, I think at the time. And it's now called the Five Day Author Ad Profit Challenge, which actually just started today or yesterday, I think. Um, if you wanna check it out, it's completely free. It's run on Facebook. It's more than five days, just so you know, it actually goes over about two weeks. It's not too late to join because they literally just started like two days ago with kind of the prep work. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes if you want to go check it out. Anyways, um, even though I was really, I didn't come out of there with a really strong, uh, like knowledge of how to market my books on Amazon. I did. Ah, I'm not saying this well. Like I did learn a lot. But what I, one of the things that I primarily learned is that my books weren't ready to advertise. So I got to the point where using their using what I learned there, I was able to get a lot of clicks on my ads, but um, I wasn't getting any conversions. So what that taught me was that I was not targeting the right readers. So with my covers, with my book descriptions, they were not actually, people, when they got to the page, they weren't seeing what it was that I had promised them from the ad, if that makes sense. So that's why I, in 2020, I went ahead and I recovered, like I ended up recovering all my books. I have reworked my book descriptions. Well, on one of my books, I've reworked it, I don't know, dozens of times because it was hard for me to figure out what exactly um, the most important things are, which is often the case when you're the author of the book and when you didn't plan it that well to begin with and you kind of just pantsed it as you went along. <laughs> oh, it gets good reviews, I promise. Anyways, <laughs> but the problem was I was giving mixed messages with my marketing because I didn't know what genre I was targeting. So once I got that straightened out, I've been able to use my advertising dollars more wisely ever since. And I have now even made a Facebook ad that profitably adver profitably advertises a standalone full priced book, Finding Heaven. Now that, I mean, I created a good book to begin with, but now that I actually have figured out how to connect that book with my target readers for that book, I have been making a profit on that ad since, oh, I just looked at it earlier this week. I think since September, um, it hasn't been in the hole and some months has been making quite a bit. And uh, right now, actually, the profit from that ad is helping to pay for marketing efforts for my fantasy series like this blog tour promotion that I'm going to try. So I call that a win. But once I get like the three books in a series out in the epic fantasy or once I get at least three of these romance books out, that's going to be when I'm going to really be able to leverage my marketing dollars to start making a half decent income from my books. So I'm very excited about that. Anyways, so thank you, Susie, for letting me read your post and for sharing it. It was great wisdom. Um, and I just want to say you need to have all of these skills. You can't just be a writer to be an indie writer. You have to be able to market well. It's an essential part of being an indie publisher, which is what you are as an indie author. So you need to have that business mindset about learning to be a good marketer. And I, I'm not going to get into a lot right now, but actually I really like marketing. I'm one of those nerds that actually enjoys it. And just a quick way of looking at it that might shift your mind if you're one of those that struggles with it. Um, I like to think of marketing as, I mean, I've mentioned several times, it's connecting your product with your readers, with your ideal readers, the people who will find value in it. But another way of looking at it is uh, telling a story or sorry, inviting your readers into a story that you're telling. And I do have a whole class on this, which I, I've taught at conferences. I am thinking about making it into, into a webinar or something. But um, yeah, it's just it's kind of a, a shift in mindset when you realize that marketers are always just telling stories and they're just inviting you to make them part of your story 
and that's all we're going to be doing for our readers. We're inviting them to make our story part of their story. And we're storytellers. So this is something that, if you think of it that way, is not so intimidating. So um, one thing I want to mention is that in all the rewriting and bazillions of rewritings of my book descriptions, I actually became pretty good at writing book descriptions. And I now offer this as a service. And uh, if you want to check that out, you can go to my website at talinawinters.com slash editing. I have it on there among my other editorial services. Um, you get a long description, a short description, a one-liner hook, and uh, I can also collaborate with you to help polish up your own description and teach you how to be a better book description writer. So anyways, know that if you don't fit in the typical writing in a series in a tight genre niche box, um, learning to advertise is still beneficial, but you need to have different goals when you start out than somebody who's further along. So you're not trying to become wealthy right away so much as trying to figure out how to market your books and making sure you're marketing them to the right people, which is a really, really important part of knowing of how to market um, is, is making sure that you're actually targeting the people, the right people who are going, going to enjoy your books. And I might talk a more about that in an epi another episode because that's kind of like a, its own big topic. All right, so just a few things before I finish up. I just want to talk about a new tool that I heard about this week. I heard it on Leslie Penelope's podcast. It's called Wide Wizard, which is a Chrome extension that's free. Just Google Wide Wizard, you'll find it. Um, and it's for basically inputting data when you're publishing your books on various wide platforms just to do it really, really quickly. Uh, it kind of like, it it can drag your, like it scrape your, your book's data from Goodreads or uh, BookBub, I think was the other one. And then you can, it just kind of will, will autofill the, the publishing forms when you're going onto other sites like Kobo or draft to digital or all these other places where you need to publish your books wide. Um, and it will input um, quite a lot of the data. There's still some stuff you have to do yourself, but I'm looking forward to trying this out because um, so I, uh, installing the extension was, was easy. The developer is a wide author who is keeping this available for free. So, um, yeah, I just recommend giving it a, a, uh, a shot. Um, also, uh, another thing I want to mention is that um, author and editor Brenda Bailey Davies is doing a webinar on January 27th through Editors Canada about self-editing for fiction writers. Now, most of Editors Canada webinars are for editors, but this is actually for writers. So I wanted to mention it. Um, Brenna is a wonderful person and, and editor and um, you don't actually have to be a Members Canada web, uh, member to take the webinar. So I'm going to include the link to it in the show notes if you want to go check it out and register. Uh, another resource I recommend for authors learning how to be better writers is the book Self-Editing for Fiction Writers by Rennie Brown and Dave King. Fantastic. Um, do any future editor a favor and go read that book and maybe read it before every manuscript you publish or submit for a while because <laughs> it's good and it's quick, but it will help you so much. <laughs> and then I read a blog post this week on the uh, Ally blog, which is the Alliance for Independent Authors. And uh, I'm not going to go through the whole blog post, but there's just one particular thing that jumped out at me I wanted to talk about. The post was what readers want in 2022, I think was what it was called. Um, I will put a link in the show notes. And they were actually quoting a study that written word, a survey that written word media had put out earlier in earlier last year about how to write a book to market. And in that survey, a lot of, uh, most readers had said that they hate cliffhangers. And I kind of chuckled about that. And it made me think about the difference between what readers think they want and what they actually want or what they need. Because I've said that I hate cliffhangers, <laughs> but I don't. Do I really? No, the thing is, when you write a book with a cliffhanger at the end, um, people hate that they kind of have that they have to go read the next book if they want to finish it or to, to get satisfaction from that story. But do they actually hate the cliffhanger? 
Well, I would posit that the only reason that people hate cliffhangers is if the next installment is not yet available and they're going to have to wait to get that satisfied feeling. Um, I would also say it probably does depend on genre. In romance, you don't want to have a cliffhanger at the end. Um, but in epic fantasy, um, sure, sci-fi, yeah. Uh, having these series with cliffhangers at the end is, is fantastic and a way to get great read through. I have a massive cliffhanger ending at the end of Undine's Tear. And uh, I felt really bad about that until I got book two out. <laughs> because now people can go ahead and, and just keep reading if they want. And then they get like a book that's twice as long. Um, so yeah, uh, I had to chuckle and think about like, I think that readers only hate, they think they hate cliffhangers, but they don't. If you really look at it. Um, I actually love them once I started thinking this through because I'm already invested and I want to keep reading to find out what happens. And if there's a cliffhanger hanger ending, then it just makes me, makes it really easy for me to pick what I'm going to read or watch next. So I think just because, a re because the survey says the readers hate cliffhanger, cliffhanger endings is not a reason to stop writing them. Just so you know. <laughs> Um, the other thing that they talked about in that post was the rise in print sales over the last two years, which uh, I don't think it surprised anyone, but I'm not on TikTok, but I am well aware of it. Everyone in my family is, and my husband, who hated social media until he had discovered TikTok, is completely addicted, and he now actually sends me little videos sometimes of book, book talkers. Um, he sent me one last week that I had to laugh at, and was somebody had I don't know if he was just trolling the book talking community or whatever, but he basically was like, send me your stitches and tell me how many books you own. And all of the responses were like, we don't talk about how many books we own. Are you kidding me? Like, but they were hilarious, of course. Um, but it made me think, like, I wonder if part of the rise of print sales is co comparable to a rise in um, in YouTube, like the, the booktube community, book talkers, uh, Instagram, where the aesthetic of having lots of beautiful printed books on shelves is becoming really, really popular. And like these, I mean, every, every addicted reader has tons of books they haven't read. I do. Um, I don't want to talk about it either, but uh, I also really love looking at those beautiful books in all those pictures that you see with, with these like color coded books or however they want to do them. I would never do mine that way, but I think it looks cool in a picture. Um, so yeah, it was just, it was just a things that make you go, hmm, I didn't see that on any surveys. Anyone checking to see is like, do you buy more books? Because you like taking pictures of them for, for social media. <laughs> Anyways, next week I'll be continuing on my, this, this editing project. It's not due until the week after, but I am hoping to kind of finish it a little early if I can, um, partly because uh, just to help the author out and partly to give myself a little grace before my next project starts. And I'm going to keep making progress on my manuscript. I'm going to keep showing up in my chair and beating the resistance dragon by just being there and being ready to write so that I do. My mug quote of the week, this is not a real one. This is one I think that I might turn into a real one and design this myself or have someone design because it's, it's a good one, is the joy is in the journey. And, um, man, that's the, one of the beautiful things about being a writer is there's always more to learn. There's always more to do. It's a huge challenging hill to climb, but, um, it's got some really beautiful views. So, uh, I hope that you have a fantastic week with writing and in general, um, if you have questions, please send me your questions. I'd love to, uh, read them out and answer them or just comments. You can go to my uh, website at talinawinters.com slash podcast and leave a comment on this post or if you're on YouTube leave it on the YouTube video um, and or you can email me at talina at talinawinters.com and if you have a favorite mug quote please send me that and I will read it out because I think that I don't know I don't know what it is but humans get really clever on mugs and bumper stickers anyway all right well thanks so much have a great week bye Coffee and Real Talk for Writers has been produced by Talina Winters. You can find episode show notes, leave a comment, subscribe, or if you're feeling generous, buy me a coffee at talinawinters.com slash podcast. And be sure to leave a review on the podcatcher of your choice. 
Tell your friends to come by too. The kettle's always on. So until next time, I hope you keep writing and keep it real. Thanks for listening. Bye.